All right. I just want to be very clear about this one. We're having different kinds of fun. And I don't like the kind of fun that Dill is having. That's okay. That's okay. Uh, all right. So, we're like this non-actual thing, and we're called mctheprofessor.gov. And, uh, yeah, so, so our, our first lecture is going to be the American History Survey Problematizing National History. Strictly speaking, a history lecture, okay? It's kind of a history lecture, but it's, it's a little more complicated than that. Because there's different levels of historical inquiry. And typically speaking, something called a history lecture is concerned with what we would call content. History content. And content is the stuff that we inquire about. This is facts, right? This is like people and events and places and things like that. This is cause effect. This is all that kind of stuff. But my concern is not so much in the content of history as much as it is the form of history. What I mean by form, this is the way that we structure our inquiry, okay? Not what it is we are inquiring about, but the way that we structure the historical inquiry. I will give you two examples to illustrate what I mean. The question, what caused the Mexican Revolution, is a content question. I don't give a shit about that. I do, it's important, but that's not what we're here for right now. A class on the national history of the United States is a structure, it is a form in which you order historical inquiry. And today we're going to take some time to examine the form of historical inquiry and to critique the form of inquiry. of this lecture is the National History Survey. And if you're not familiar with what these things are, let me explain. Anyone who's been in high school or college knows that the history classes you take are what are called survey classes, which means you're getting a brief treatment of a broad field, right? Western thought or African history or modern world history or whatever else. This is a uh, a, a long period of time covered in a very short span and you're only going, you know, yay deep, right? A national history course, American history, you know, that sort of thing, is organized around a chronological narrative of national development. This is a linear story of the way that a nation goes from not being to being, okay? And how the nation develops. And necessarily how the nation goes from wherever it was in the past to wherever it is right now. I find this form of inquiry to be inadequate, and I want to explain to you why. Here is the problem with structuring your historical inquiry around the, this sort of national survey narrative, right? If you are trying to build a story of the growth and development of the nation, you run into a couple of really problematic inevitabilities. National History Survey courses require, require by their nature, the construction of an apparently natural historical order and organization across time and across subject. What this means is you have to take disorder, you have to take the chaos that is just things that exist, and you have to order them in some kind of way that makes sense, that there's some kind of logical process and progress that ends with the present moment. Right? This is something you need to do in order to have a national history class. It's absolutely required. And this means that you are making things up, essentially. You are selecting and deselecting right? which details you choose, and which order you put them in, which things you focus on, which things you don't focus on, in order to build a narrative that makes sense. Right? And this means a great deal of trouble.
So let's break this into three parts, okay? Let's problematize national histories. Let's take this format and make it into something that we can understand. There are three central problems with the format of the National History Survey. I will take these all in turn. What is the nation? What are the definitive components of national identity? Are the themes of belonging and exclusion essential to national histories? And is it possible to construct a national history that does not assume that the present was inevitable? We'll take them in turn. So first of all, obviously, if you are going to have a national history chorus, you have to know what the nation is. And you have to begin from a definition of what the nation is. If you don't know how to define the nation, you don't know how to, you know, what, what are you telling the history of, right? Um, and this means you have to figure out what national identity is. Not just what, but who constitutes the nation. Is it the state? Language? History itself could be said to shape what it is and is not the nation, right? Territory, physical territory, whatever culture is, you know, who can, what, who can say? Um, or perhaps the symbolism, flags and, and anthems and the like. What is it that actually defines what the nation is? This matters. And one thing you'll notice about this is these are all radically exclusionary things, right? If you want to define nation solely on the basis of language, or define nation solely on the basis of some kind of symbolism or upon some kind of construction of what culture is, what you find is a fundamentally exclusive definition of the nation, and that means your history is going to be a fundamentally exclusive history. Which brings us to this. In the attempt to define what a nation is, which is the prerequisite for structuring your history of the nation, you have to decide what the nation is not. You see? And what this means is that there is no way to tell the history of a nation without deciding that some people who are a part of that process do not get to be a part of that process. And without privileging the narratives of certain elements of what you call the nation. Belonging and exclusion are essential elements of nation building. I mean, consider this just, just something to think about. Your American National History Survey ends usually in 1865, the first half, and it begins sometime in the 1600s. The first two-thirds of an early American history survey predate the nation. So where do you, what is it a history of? The history of English-speaking settlers in Virginia? Right? But what does this mean for indigenous histories? It's a complete erasure, right? And it's a structural erasure. You have to erase those histories in order to write the national story. There's no getting around it. talk about this in terms of citizenship, citizen and alien. Settler or indigenous in the case of settler colonial societies, right? Free and unfree, designations that exist in various forms all over the world, but help to define the fundamental belonging and exclusion in the national narrative. I want to emphasize that this is not something which you can escape within the format of the national history. It is a part of the fabric of the structure. Now consider some of the ways that this particular conundrum infiltrates our histories. United States history is a history of settler colonialism and of imperialism. We know this, right? 
violent land seizures, slavery, and other forms of unfree labor, attempts to displace and or destroy indigenous populations. All of these elements are a part of the national history of the United States. But because, because we now live in a world where it is not terribly kind to acknowledge these things, and where people are not comfortable acknowledging these things, we construct our national histories in a way that naturalize and justify these fundamental elements of the nation's history, right? And so, for example, the history of slavery in America becomes the history of overcoming slavery, right? And the history of indigenous people in America becomes, you know, some tale of indigenous survival that erases the fact that we're living in stolen land, right? You can't take seriously the fact that you live on stolen land. You cannot take seriously the fact that we live on stolen land if the history that we tell ourselves naturalizes the present, makes normal the present. Which brings me to the final point. Is it possible to construct a national history that does not assume that the present was inevitable? Inasmuch as our histories are a history of the present, we are always going to naturalize and justify those horrendous things that brought us to this moment. The entire Jim Crow era becomes a prelude to the civil rights movement. Rather than the civil rights movement being a radical break with what had been the status quo. What impact is it going to have on our children when we teach them in the classrooms that the present was inevitable? What does that do? This gives us this very strange fallacy in the way that we understand history, right? Where we sort of assume this natural, inevitable progress. Right? The present is pretty good, which means all things that happened in the past are just leading up to the present. So they were all, if not necessary, you know, they were at least steps toward this, this present, which is you know, somewhat fine. So people look at things like racism and segregation, and they say, oh yeah, well, that was really bad 50 years ago, and it was really bad in the past, but now it's fine, right? Which means history naturally moves in this direction, which means all the things that happened in the past are basically okay. We were gonna get to this point anyway. And when you raise generations and generations of people to think like that, and to not acknowledge the fact that it took radical breaks with the status quo to make any kind of positive change in society, people get very complacent. And they assume a kind of incrementalism. These problems will just go away naturally over time as they always have, is the belief. And it is a dangerous and erroneous belief. And I would argue that any person who stands today and says, yeah, I think things are just going to improve naturally over time, only believes that because somewhere down the line they took an American history course that structured their brain to believe this to be the case. Because we are trapped with the National History Survey as our format, as our structure of historical inquiry. fine now. Think about this as well, okay. Even the way that we structure the, the, the linear narrative of our early American history surveys is rooted in colonialism, but it's not described as such. We have, in our classrooms today, what you could call an east-west chronology. American history begins on the east coast with European settlement. When if you talk about the peopling of this land, it is the plains that are the oldest part of the country. Right? The Great Plains were peopled thousands of years before the East Coast was. But our history moves in the direction of the empire, which is east to west. This is not necessary. But it is an essential part of the structure of a national history survey along the lines of what we do now. 
need to figure out a way to address these issues. Okay, so what do we do with this? What do we do with this insight? What is clear is that we have to challenge the form, not just the content, right? It's all well and good to sort of offer alternative histories and offer revisions and all this, but at the end of the day, you're not going to be able to solve these fundamental problems until you challenge the form of the National History Survey. And as somebody who is an employee of the state, this is an incredibly difficult thing to do because we are bound by curriculum that is written by someone uh, that is not entirely in agreement with me on this point. There's no silver bullet to this, unfortunately, but there are a few things we can think about, specific ways that we can change, and even people working in classrooms today can change the way that they approach history. Shifts in sensibility, perhaps. How can we structure historical inquiry in a way that does not exclude or marginalize people? I'll give you a hint. Representation is not going to fix that. Unfortunately. Right? Adding a little box in the textbook that says, let's talk about some women during the colonial period, doesn't fix it. Tweaking representation and working within the politics of representation does not fix the problem. How can we structure historical inquiry in a way that does not, <coughs> or that offers a non-hegemonic present? What I mean by this is, if one of the problems of the National History Survey is that we assume the present as it is now is inevitable, You're erasing all the historical possibilities that didn't quite play out. Take the example of indigenous histories, for example. It's very difficult for you to tell a story of indigenous history that is not fundamentally if not a story of survival, a story of destruction, right? I mean, we can sort of reclaim, the you know, people reclaim these histories by focusing on, on those, you know, sort of cultural survivals and, and, and the like, and the survival of indigenous communities. But at the end of the day, we live in a present where settler colonialism won. And when we teach a history that naturalizes that present, we erase all the alternatives that could have been. And this is a very dangerous thing to do. It's a vexing question. I don't really have an answer for it, but it's something to think about. And finally, how can we structure our historical inquiry in a way that meaningfully explains settler colonialism, slavery, etc., without implicitly justifying them and without naturalizing them? Right? This is the biggest problem. I do not know how we do this. I try to do this every day in my classroom. It is incredibly difficult. I don't know if I'm succeeding or not. But this is something which we need to think about. Because as long as we continue to focus solely upon the politics of representation, and adding more little boxes into the corners of the textbooks, we're not going to get at the heart of the problem, which is a radical break with the existing forms of our historical inquiry. If you have any suggestions, I'm, I'm listening.
Thank you.